Do not throw one word, I'll throw one word at you, you throw one word back. Okay. Ready? Sure. All right, start. Hey, welcome to 42, Two Souls, One Journey, a raw and un unedited look into our lives as humans. Based on the 21 grams experiments by Dr. Duncan McDougall, who concluded that the human soul weighs 21 grams. This video cast will explore that no matter what our lives look like on paper, our souls journey the same. 21 plus 21, 42, get it? I know, math genius. In this episode, I'm super excited. We're speaking with Canadian journalist, cartoonist, community activist, politician, a lifelong Winnipegger. You will find him most mornings sitting outside Parlor Coffee on the corner of Maine and Vanatine in shorts or covered in a blanket almost all year round. In fact, I ran into him this morning. The creative, the reliable, the fun, and the belated birthday boy, Kai Hasselreese. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Good <laughs> morning oh. again. It How was are great you? to see you in person, and now it's good to see you virtually. Yeah, I'm super excited. I feel like I've been waiting. Like We talked about this last year in 2020, and now 2021, uh, with my mission to introduce the world to Winnipeggers. Mm -hmm. Uh, or winter peggers, as all my Toronto friends say. <laughs> we say that too. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's nice to sort of start off with you because I feel like you were one of the first few faces I met when I was here. You were pre-introduced to me by our friend Neil in Toronto. Uh, and I think, I mean, all your biography, if anybody Googles you, it says lifelong Winnipegger. So, <laughs> so let's start with that first of all. Like, tell me what makes you a lifelong Winnipegger? I never made it out. <laughs> yeah, a lot of other Winnipeggers escape, but uh, I've tried many times to get away, but I, I've never actually succeeded. Uh, oh. I, I've tried to leave a few times. I have lived in a few other cities. I've traveled a whole heck of a lot all over the world, but I've always been drawn back to Winnipeg. Uh, but yes, you're right. I am a lifelong Winnipegger. I was born here uh, in 1974 um, and I was raised here. I grew up in Winnipeg and, and I know the city so well, you could pretty much blindfold me and throw me in a truck, trunk and drive me anywhere, take me out and I could probably figure out where I am. I feel like that would be a fun game to play specifically <laughs> because <laughs> I'll tell you why. So, you know, you're a cartoonist and has written some three fantastic books that I've got. And the one I haven't read yet is The Golden Boy and the Case of the Missing Cube. And I feel like I want to attach a game to it. And maybe this is the game to do is to tie you up, <laughs> blindfold you, and then drop you off at one of these spots and see if you can figure it out. I mean, I guess you would be because you already drew it. But, uh, but let's save the book for the ne like for, ne for our next topic. Okay. But... So born in Winnipeg, you, you, I'm surprised to hear you saying that you left and like you wanted to leave because I feel like from knowing you and meeting you, this is home for you. I feel like this is like it's a choice you've made to stay here because this is what feels most you. Am I? Uh, yeah, and I think that's maybe what I've gradually realized over the course of my life is that this is the place where I feel most comfortable. It is where I have the most friends and the most people who care about me. Uh, and it is a good city that is a, a jumping off point. You know, it's fairly inexpensive to live in Winnipeg. And so I can have a decent lifestyle here and still save enough money to travel and get the hell out whenever I'm getting tired of it, which it's hard to believe, but yes, it does happen. Like uh, to all Winnipegers, we, we reach our limit and then we want to get the F out. And that's, that's uh, been the motivation for a lot of my travels. But I do think that a lot of Winnipeggers come with an inferiority complex. There's that infamous weaker than song, One Great City, uh, where the refrain is, I hate Winnipeg. Yes. Uh, and we all do have a pretty intense love-hate relationship with the city. And yeah, sometimes we love it. There are lots of lovable, lovable things about it. And sometimes we hate it and just have to get out. And, and I think that, you know, we're a mid-sized city and we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, the next biggest city to drive to is Minneapolis. And that's 
eight or nine hours away and we can't even drive there right now like as of you know several months ago the border is closed uh so even that as a road trip is closed to us um so i think that as a result of being isolated and being the what eight nine tenth eleventh who knows at this point biggest city in canada you know we've been plummeting fast we reached our peak about a hundred years ago number three uh, for population in the country, and it's been kind of going steadily down. So I think that, you know, a lot of Winnipeggers feel like we should aspire to go to a bigger place and succeed in some bigger city. Right. Uh, and then if we don't, then maybe there's something wrong with us. Uh, and I think that a lot of us have to get over that hump. And I'm pleased to say I'm more or less over that hump <laughs> and here I am I'm yeah I'm a proud Winnipegger and as you know I love to show off my city and tell people that uh, it's a worthwhile place to visit and live. And I think I have to back you up on it I mean Condé Nast uh, said Winnipeg was on the top list like well the Winnipeg Art Museum the Inuit Gallery is number one to visit in 2021 in a pandemic state where people aren't allowed to go anywhere like Winnipeg's number one. I feel like that, like this inferiority complex has to go because there's some really cool, as somebody who left Toronto to come to Winnipeg and is a fall in love with Winnipeg, there's so much here that Winnipeg offers that I don't think people, like people need to give it a chance to explore it, to sort of figure it out and enjoy it. I think being a lifelong Winnipegger, you've made an amazing choice. <laughs> uh, and you're probably the best spokesperson for Winnipeg. Like. You love it. You ha you talk about all the great places to go to, uh, and you're quite comfortable being like, I don't care what you think. I'm here, <laughs> and I'm loving it, which is amazing. Okay, good. Yeah. So love hate relationships. I know I hear. So let's talk about the hate first because it's easy to get out of the way. So everybody, everybody in Winnipeg talks about February in Winnipeg. Like <laughs> it, it's it's sort of the the apex of when people are sick and tired of Winnipeg. Um, is, is that true for you or how do you, what's your, what's your hate apex of Winnipeg? <laughs> if that's a question. You know, my, my hate for Winnipeg when I do hate it has less to do with the winter and more to do with some other issues. But I, I will say oh. for winter that, yeah, February can be tough. I, you know, I often say it's the shortest month, but it can seem like the longest month because it's, you know, often it's really cold in December, really cold in January. And by the time February comes and it's still really cold, we're like, okay, we're done with this now. And it's still dark. And, you know, on a non-pandemic year, though, there's the Festival de Voyageur, which is one of the greatest winter festivals in the entire country. Uh, and it's a rocking good time for a couple of weeks in the middle of February. So there's always that to look forward to. I actually think that the apex of Winnipeg hate when it comes to weather is more like brace for it, April. And that's because, you know, other most other cities in Canada by April are enjoying springtime and Winnipeg. You know, sometimes like we can have some nice weather and then we have like a last minute snowstorm. Like April in Winnipeg is like that horror movie where you thought the uh, you <laughs> thought the, the killer was dead. Uh, right. And then it turns out, eh, 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 you know, there's still a little bit in him. Um, right. That's what winter in Winnipeg can be like. It just gets to the point where it's like, OK, it's now six months in and we've had it with the snow and everything else. You know, but my hate with Winnipeg is, you know, I mean, it's a lot like any mid-sized city, right? Like it's it's great to know a lot of people and sometimes it's not great to know a lot of people. And especially when you're gay in a city like Winnipeg. Um, yeah, you know, it's not, I, I'm not gay and single anymore. Um, I have a partner and I have had for the last few years and we live together. So I'm not on that scene. But certainly when I was in the gay single scene of Winnipeg, uh, it could feel pretty discouraging just because the options are just, you know, can seem really limited, you know, like there's, you know, I mean, I was kind of coming of age when the bar scene was still a big deal, pre-apps, like all that kind of thing. And so you'd go to the same one or two bars every single weekend and see the same one or two guys and like, you know like it was just like okay same one or two guys it sounds like, <laughs> like <laughs> in a bar. 
it's not that pathetic. Yeah. But um, and it's not just being gay. I, I think that that Winnipeg can be a tough town to be single in. But um, on the other hand, on the flip side, God, I've lived in Toronto and I've I've been single in Toronto and I certainly have lots of friends in Toronto. And there it's the opposite problem of almost like too much choice. You know, you're out on a date with someone and they're on their phone setting up the next three days. So um, there's an uh Let's stick with Winnipeg with this interview. But um, at any rate, there you go. Uh, you know, love it, hate it. Um, it's, but that's like a lot of cities, you know, it's not just, it's not just this one. I mean, so, you know, let's quickly, let's quickly tap in Toronto. You were in Toronto, like during the 1997 to 2002, which is for me is when I came out. And I feel like that was the apex of gayness in Toronto. Like, I feel like we didn't have the apps yet. The bars were always packed. People were, I don't know, they were fun and gay. And like, like, I, I guess I came out in 1997. So for me, that whole year was a year of like being at the bar, meeting friends, meeting people. But it was such a different... Like we, the great thing about this is we shared that time and like we were there at the same time. And Toronto, as vibrant and fun as gay as was, there was never, like it still didn't, it still felt like it was monotonous. Like there was always a say, like you always went to the same bars, you always met the same people. So even though we were not in Winnipeg at that point, we were in Toronto, it was same, the same bars, still the same people. And if you talk to people about like who went to Buddies at that time, they remember the stairs guy. Like there's always this one person you, everybody remembers. They're like, oh, stair guys from buddies. We always saw the same faces. Um, so it doesn't seem like it was any different than it would be in Winnipeg, right? Like I feel like a city just becomes this something that staples about a city that stays that way, no matter straight, gay. Um, yeah, you know, I remember being at Ryerson University starting in 1995 and I graduated in 97 and it was at Ryerson when I came out of the closet. And Ryerson was smack dab basically in the middle of the gay neighborhood, like, you know, right at the very opposite end of the whole Church and Wellesley neighborhood. Uh, and I actually remember just being kind of overwhelmed by it. Like it was almost like too gay. Like it was just like, <laughs> okay, I got it. Like there's gay men everywhere. Like it was like, I, I need a bit more variety and diversity in my life. I can't, you know, like the friends that I had who loved Church and Wellesley and who, lived there and lived that gay life 24 7 i i couldn't be one of those people and then the flip side is winnipeg where right. sometimes i just you know if you're talking about february i remember years and years ago i was single and so was my best friend claire who's a lesbian and i remember you know i remember we it was february and it was the dead of winter and we were just going around winnipeg just trying to find any gay people like it's like, you know, like we heard rumors of like a gay bowling club and we went to the bowling alley and they they weren't there and we would go to the cafes and the cafes were all empty and it was just like oh my god we just need some gay content in our lives and we are not getting it and that was probably around the year i remember um shopping for uh, car valentine's cards with my friend allison and we were like we just want a crush like at this point right. <laughs> you know it's like we've given up even hope for a boyfriend or like a hookup right. we just want a crush we just want like one guy like one cashier at a store or barista or something who like you know gets our heart to slightly flutter uh so yeah sometimes in winnipeg it can seem a bit like you know is anybody here but you know, when I came back to Winnipeg after Ryerson, um, I was fortunate enough to live at Homo Heaven for quite a few years on and off. I was the known as the boomerang child of Homo Heaven. And that was a big gay house in Osborne Village uh, that was basically just a great place to live. There were always quite a few of us there. And it was very transient. Like some people would be there for months or even a year or two and then others would just be there for one or two or three nights or six weeks at a time like it would attract a lot of artists who would be traveling through town or coming to Winnipeg for a gig whether it was musicians or actors who would perform in a Manitoba to the theater center show and they would hear about homo heaven and and live for a few weeks in the house and that was a really great coming out space in Winnipeg back in the day uh, just with good parties and good people to meet and always a bit of drama and lots of gossip. And it was a bit of a, 
center point. So I feel fortunate to have had that type of experience in the Prairie City, you know, which mm. um, which you can't get in Toronto, you know, right. like it's uh, so it's definitely there's some unique things about Winnipeg and being gay in Winnipeg. Oh, a homo heaven. I'm going to have to look that up. And uh, as I interview more Winnipeggers, I'm going to see what what our new uh, homo heaven looks like <laughs> and where it is. As the as the world will start to open, I hope, <laughs> maybe right, homo right, heaven right. will be relevant, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, car- oh, wait, oh, wait. So the two things you love about Winnipeg. We talked about the hate and the apex of hate, but what about the, the love? Like... Well, if, you know, and this is a segue into, um, you know, cartooning, but, uh, you know, one, I mean, I, I'll just say that one huge thing I love about Winnipeg is the area where you live and where I live, which is the exchange right. district, which is this uh, neighborhood filled with uh, turn of the 20th century uh, buildings. Uh, the neighborhood is, there's, it's it's one of the outside of pretty much Gastown in Vancouver and old uh, Montreal and I suppose old Quebec City. It's one of the few neighborhoods in the entire country, one of the few like urban downtown areas where uh, all the buildings from 100 plus years ago, uh, for the most part, are still here. So you can still walk the streets and feel the history of the place and imagine that you are in this kind of like timeless vortex and so I love the exchange district and where I live it's right near the river and it gives me easy access to um, downtown and the forks and walking across the bridge to the to St. Boniface and it's got my favorite coffee shop and if that's ever closed (laughs) there's like (laughs) half a dozen other coffee shops to hit uh, within the 20 uh, minute or so walk from here Uh, I don't own a car I have pretty much become anti-car. I pride myself on having this uh, walking and cycling and bus busing life. And that is uh, easy to have where I live. I feel like everything is within, uh, everything I need is pretty much within a 20, 30 uh, minute walk from here. And so the exchange district and good restaurants like uh, Clementine uh, Mm. that we hit up um, uh, before sadly it and all of the restaurants were closed, but uh, uh, it'll reopen. And uh, yeah, so there you go, Exchange District. And to segue into uh, some of my cartooning work, it inspires me in terms of an artist. Yeah, so, I mean, definitely, I think the exchange is great. So the, the things, you, it's so interesting, the way you talk about your life in, in Winnipeg is so similar to how my roommate who, is quintessential downtown Toronto boy. Like he's like, I want to walk everywhere. I don't need a car. I want to have my favorite coffee shops within, you know, this uh, within five kilometers of, of uh, my space. Not even like he just wants one around the corner. And yeah. I feel like, you know, like Winnipeg doesn't get like it's exactly what Toronto offers you. You have it in Winnipeg. It's just maybe not as grand or as large, but it's not any different. Like, you know, it's it's offers everything in a smaller contained space with, I have to say this, a lot nicer people that like, I don't even know any of my neighbors in Toronto and I lived there for over 30 years. So I like would have to go, actually the only reason I would know my neighbors because I wanted to sleep with them or I saw them on Grindr. Outside of that, I would not even know who my next door neighbors were. Meanwhile in Winnipeg, you know, everyone goes out of their way to say hello to make sure they know who you are in the building. There's sort of a different community feel here. So it's got everything Toronto has to offer plus real Canadiana people. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And yeah. I, I agree with you even in my building and I'm not that far from you in the exchange district. Right. I know a lot of people in my building and even you know, a lot of my neighbors I would say are my friends yeah. uh, and even some of my best friends are living literally under the same roof uh-huh. as me in the same apartment block. So. Yeah. Uh, and I love the exchange because of the people. I just see, like you, I ran into this morning, you know, and then uh, a minute or two later, after you walked off, the owner of the cafe where I go, he pulled up and we chatted for a few minutes. So there's there's always people walking up and down the street. It would be nice to have some more people down here. And that's, you know, 
that's one of the hateable things about Winnipeg is that the suburbs have just totally, right. you know, I mean, the downtown is great and the exchange is great, but there are fewer and fewer people down here and more and more people spread out living in these vast suburbs. Cause one of the things about living in a prairie city is there's just way too much space and everybody's, you know, <laughs> uh fled um and i feel like where's everyone going let's you know let's let's all come back to downtown uh but uh you know i i want to live in the world that i i I do my best to try to live in the world that i want to live in and yes the you're talking about your roommate and his desires to be in a very urban space with a good coffee shop right around the corner and some neighbors to say hello to uh, yes, you can have that in Winnipeg too. And I try my best to do it. Yeah, I, I think you nail it. I feel like in talking to you and seeing the way you live life, you, that's, you, you've been able to find like the best of whatever this cosmopolitan Toronto world is or the world outside and the greatness of Winnipeg and maintained it. So, you know, you, the kudos, I think like you should be the next mayor of Winnipeg is where I'm going with this. I think like <laughs> you, the next well, game. As a matter of fact, I did once run for mayor of Winnipeg and uh, I had a campaign button and the slogan was the next mayor of Winnipeg, um, <laughs> which at the time, even when we made that button, um, we were like, oh, if I, you know, if I don't win this time, it can, I can always be the next mayor of Winnipeg. Right. <laughs> right? Like, right. I'm always the next mayor of Winnipeg until I'm actually the mayor. So there right. you go. Yeah. I mean, that's a great campaign slogan on a marketing scheme. I feel like that's brilliant. And it's got legs for life. Like it's got a good 10, 15 year longevity that you could, you know, you could keep. And then if you had kids or if you adopted kids, like could be the Hasselby's continuation of like. <laughs> I can show you my, all my Merrill campaign stuff. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And I agree, but a lot of people say that I had the best designed Uh, political campaign pretty much ever in Winnipeg. Uh, It was designed by a friend of mine who is, was and is back now in Toronto. But uh, anyway, it's it's a graphic designer named Zab who uh, lived in Winnipeg for a few years, including when I ran for mayor and she did all the design work for uh, the campaign. And it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, take another podcast and talk about design. I think it'd be really fun to sort of see um what they came up so speaking of design and art and cartooning uh so i mean your other books which are camel in canada politikids are i already sent to my kids in toronto like my uh my kids you know my friend's kids and and i I held on to this one because i was like okay i want to know this is more about being in winnipeg and exploring where we are so cartoonist so not illustrator but cartoonist tell me how and why cartoonist over illustrator because i feel like illustrator it's i'll stop the question right there yeah illustrator is the more the is the more common word cartoonists has a very i, I don't know for me it has a very dated dated or a very time and place but i'm really fascinated to see how you came up with cartoonist over illustrator uh you you could uh chat with this uh with my um chat about this with my boyfriend wally too who uh objects to me calling myself a cartoonist and thinks that i'm limiting myself and uh that i should call myself an illustrator um why do i call myself a cartoonist um i because i feel like that's what my artwork style is you know like i i kind of I mean, my quick history of cartooning is that I drew a lot of cartoons when I was a kid. Uh, I drew a comic book when I was in junior high called Boomerang Beavers, and I self-published three different uh, issues of it and sold it to all my friends for a dollar each. And I did all the cartoons for uh, my high school yearbook, and I drew political cartoons for the high school newspaper. And then I stopped drawing essentially for like 20 plus years while I went to university and became a journalist and became politically active and ran for things and traveled the world and blah, blah, blah. Uh, And then a couple of years ago, I left CBC where I was working for a long time and thought, okay, what do I want to do now? And I thought, okay, I used to draw cartoons. Um, I 
I just want to see if I still can draw cartoons and if I still like to draw cartoons. Uh, so I, I sat down at the old drawing board and uh, it started with me drawing political cartoons and tweeting them out. And I got a really good response from them. And then I started thinking, okay, that's great, but how can I make money off this? Right. And so the last uh, actually two years now has been spent um, trying to figure out, okay, how can I monetize this? Uh, and I like the word cartoonist and I, and I think that that is what I do. Like I, I, I like to say that all my drawings are cute, colorful, amusing. And that to me is what a cartoon is. Like if I were to start calling myself an illustrator, I just worry that people would expect that, like I'm looking at, you know, you right now with all the, the great art, behind you, I, which is produced by people who I'm sure might call themselves illustrators. Uh, there's even some of your work back there. I don't do that kind of thing. Yeah, I, 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 I cartoon, I, I, I do cute, colorful, amusing. I, do, I draw cartoon characters. Um, I draw real life people as if they are cartoons. And so when it came time to deciding, okay, I'm going to put myself out there. It just seemed like cartoonist was the right word to describe myself. And I even made um, business cards that said Kai Hassery's cartoonist. And it, I suppose it's niche. There's no doubt about it. You know, like if I called myself illustrator, uh, I think I might like, maybe I get more gigs or more opportunities. Like, but I, I don't think I can deliver the kinds of illustrations that are, for instance, on the wall behind you. And so I don't want to promise anything that I, that I don't want to do or can't do. And what I feel like I can do is cartoonist. Um, and actually, if you look at my Twitter profile, uh, the very first, it just says cartoonist exclamation point. <laughs> and I'm in large part uh, inspired by uh, Raina Telgemeier, who is one of the most famous cartooners in the, uh, cartoonists in the world, uh, she draws graphic novels for uh, kids and young adults that sell millions of copies. And if you go to her social media, she fucking owns it. She just calls herself cartoonist exclamation point. And I'm like, you go and I'm just gonna, yeah, that's, that's what I am. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. No, I love it. I think one, it it separates you from a sea of illustrators. Cartoon has a very, like I think back to Disney cartoons and I think yeah. back to like, my favorite Disney cartoon is Dumbo. And, you know, I rewatched the digitally enhanced version recently, but you can see all the lines of the sketches of them. Like you can see that there was a human element behind the sketch, uh, behind the cartoon, behind the anima animation. Uh, and I think it's who you are. I, I feel like the one thing you're, you know, you're like, this is my brand. This is my brand. This is who, this is not even your brand. This is just who I am. Mm -hmm. And you hold on to it no matter who challenges you or who suggests something else. Um, and if you look at, look at your drawings, even though there's di they're digitalized, there's still, you can tell there's a hand element in there, right? That somebody used a pen and a marker and. Oh, um, there is nothing digital about those. That is, it's scanned and that's oh. the only digital thing about that artwork. Yeah, I, I like to say that if I ever start up a comic book company, like if I actually incorporated and, you know, called myself a business, right. um, that I want my business to be called Screen Free Comics because I, I draw entirely by hand, pencil, eraser, and then I do my inking with Sharpies. And then I've got these kind of slightly expensive markers um, that I buy from Artist Emporium. Uh, here in St. James, uh, and I color all my comic books totally by hand, and then I scan them. So, yeah, there's there, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing. I at one point uh, I did kind of try to teach Photoshop to myself, and then I was like, eh, I'm just so this isn't what I want to do, and this isn't what I want to be, and I want to stick to pen and paper as much as possible. Okay, so I, I'll eat my words on that. I, I for, for some reason thought there was some digital enhancement or cleanup that needs to happen, but no, then this is all you through and through. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Like, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a yeah. skill that I think we don't, 
we don't value, we don't talk about, we don't, uh, we've gone so digital with so many things that it's sort of nice to come back to uh, the pen and, pen and paper. Or pen. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your books. I think they're super exciting. So Polluted Kids was your first one. And in that you talk about four politicians in Canada at a specific time who were running at that point, I believe. And you just introduced them, you introduced, you were introducing people to them as child, as kids. Um, yeah, the four leaders of the so. national parties from the last federal election. So yeah, my first book was Politikids that I produced in time for the 2019 federal election. And the leaders at the time were Justin, Andrew, Jugmeet and Elizabeth. Right. Uh, and so I drew their kind of origin stories, their true origin stories, because uh, I read their biographies to do my research. And each story zeroed in on the moment in their lives when they became political right. as kids. Because uh, I used to be a political kid. I was politically active from the time I was really young. And I produced, I created that book partly because I know if I was a kid who was interested in politics as young as nine and 10 years old, um, there must be other kids like me out there. And so I did and yeah, sold a thousand of them. And, and then I, yeah, had then, well, I sold a thousand of them. Then I, then I went traveling for a few months because I was sick and tired of Winnipeg. Um, <laughs> And then when I came back, the pandemic started and I was like, am I still doing this cartoonist thing? Right. <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes, I am. And then I got the idea to do the second book, which was Kamala in Canada, all right. about uh, Kamala Harris, uh, because she grew up partly in Montreal and her story of becoming a political kid while she was here in Canada. And uh, that book is still selling for me, actually. That's like beyond a thousand copies at this point. Like I just sold a hundred to... Um, the U.S. consulate in Montreal to nice. celebrate Kamala Harris's uh, inauguration. No big deal. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and, and that's coming up, right? I feel like that's going to happen soon in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the inauguration is uh, January twentieth, right? Yeah. Um, so, so yes, as long as Donald Trump leaves the White House, uh, <laughs> there will be a new president <laughs> and vice president. <laughs> Uh, on January 20th, yeah. I mean, even if he doesn't leave for the book, for your book, the fact that Kamala is out there, like, you know, being the first colored female vice president already speaks so highly of like, like I don't know, I feel like you've captured a really great market, uh, but also a great, uh, like across the board with your books, it's the point where kids become, when you're political as a kid and how you take that into your future. Right, that, that's the consistent story across Kamala and then political kids as well. It was this moment yeah. in their lives where they stood up for something where they said, no more of this, I'm yeah. gonna fight against the big guy or you know, yeah. challenge something. Uh, what was your political kid moment then? Like what was the moment in your life where you challenged something? Um, that you know, it's funny, I was just thinking this other day. Um, I, you know, I, there was, it, I remember it's, you know, it's so interesting even telling the story now in the year 2020, because all of our conversations around gender, because it is a story about gender. So I, when I went to junior high school, I went to junior high here in Winnipeg at Charles of Junior High uh, in the suburbs. And I was in, I remember I was in grade seven and I don't know about you and where you went to school, but I, there was spirit weeks and Spirit Week involved a different um, dress up day every day. So there would be, for instance, pajama day and all the kids would wear their pajamas to school. So that, I remember that was one of them. You know, I remember one of the, the days that the student council came up with for a Spirit Week costume day was opposite sex day. And so all the kids were encouraged to dress like the opposite sex. I, now I'm kind of like, as I'm, except that no boy would ever dress as a girl. You know, like really opposite sex day was all about the girls dressing up as boys, but it was still the 1980s. Right. And 
You know, I can remember being at Charles at junior high and having classmates make jokes about AIDS and, you know, gay people. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a positive time to be growing up gay, you know, like, and not knowing it, which I didn't know at the time, but I would say my classmates certainly knew that there was something different about me because I got teased ahead of opposite sex day and all, all like all sorts of guys would say, are you going to dress, you know, I think they even said like, oh, are you going to dress up as a boy, right? Like they perceived me as already being kind of girly. Right. At any rate, I was teased. And so were a, a couple other boys in the class about this whole opposite sex day and how we would look for it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, anyway, we complained to our teacher um, about the whole thing. We just said that it was just a stupid idea, um, you know, and people should be allowed to dress however they fucking want any day of the year, et cetera, whatever. Um, and we got opposite sex day uh, eliminated <laughs> from Charles and junior high. So that was definitely, you know, I mean, back when I was just 14 or so years old, that was definitely a Kamala style because in the Kamala and right. Canada book, for her, it's around that same age. And she's living in an apartment building in Montreal and the landlord tells all the kids, you're not allowed to play soccer in the courtyard anymore. And she's like, this is bullshit. I'm gonna, you know, organize a protest, and then she gets it overturned so that the kids can play soccer. So, yeah. So there you go. That's um, if I was gonna do a politics on myself, I would reflect a bit more on um, opposite the whole opposite sex day controversy, which actually would be an interesting story to tell now, 30 or so years later, because it's especially, you know, because the 1980s was an era when, yeah, you know, big hair for girls and you know, sports jackets for boys. Like, I mean, up until really recently, girls dress like girls, boys dress like boys. Like the gender, you know, divisions of fashion were very clear. And and to this day, like I'm amazed when I, I remember I was at the Forks, you know, when it was still open before the pandemic. And I saw some kid who was, looked like my age when I was complaining about opposite sex day. and. It was one of those moments for me where it was like, wow, you are dressed in a way that would have for sure gotten me beaten up and teased in school, but you are being yourself and owning it. And I bet you are actually a popular kid these days, you know, because I, I perceive that a lot of the most popular kids are the ones who are these days are the ones who are actually just uh, confident enough to be themselves you know, and to eh, like, and now there's just like gender, what is it? You know, what there's is, all right. sorts of kids just rejecting <laughs> that kind of thing outright. You know, for me, even the language of that back in the late 1980s in Winnipeg to say, oh, I, you know, what, what is it to dress like a boy and dress like a girl? And it like, you know, we weren't making those arguments in our complaints, you know, cause we didn't even have the, the language or the thinking around that in the same way that kids have these days whoa we just got on a totally different topic but uh but there you go yeah that's uh, that was a politicid moment for me oh i love it i feel like again still so relevant right like 1980s and here we are in 2021 and there's still such a big fight for gender well one gender equality two just like what is gender what this construct that somebody made up based on your genitalia based on very specific genitalia um, that doesn't necessarily match who you are on the inside uh, all the time. And how we're just keep, people, like people kept getting boxed into things, right? And I mean, it's a fight. You could have started back then and still, cont- like you could still keep advocating for it. And it would be your big political politi- moment consistently, you know? Um, so that's fantastic. Also for me, I don't know, we, we've had this conversation how like since coming to Winnipeg, them, they and them pronouns are so much more prevalent in the queer life here or in the queer circles here than they were ever in Toronto for me. I feel like in Toronto, it was such a like, you're gay or lesbian. There was the queer umbrella. It wasn't as, I don't know what the right word is, but the queer umbrella for me wasn't as available, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't know a lot of people who are they or thems out there. 
having this also say that I have a very heteronormative <laughs> uh, group of friends in Toronto and I'm being exposed to very cool different people here. Um, but that was something that I didn't even think about. And I think this is assumption that you're from Toronto, you should like, these are things that you already know when you're doing. And I was like, you'll be surprised at how unpolitically activated I am out there, or I'm not part of the queer conversation because there's just so many different brackets and so many different niches out there that we're not all fighting for the same cause while in Winnipeg, you know, like everyone, like you don't have multiple groups who are act, queer groups who are fighting for different things. It's one group who is fighting for all these equalities. Um, and it's something very warm and friendly about that. You know, like we're, we're banned together for a one cause. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know where I was going to go with that. But <laughs> no, it's a good, it's an interesting observation that yeah. to you, at least Winnipeg seems a bit more progressive in some ways than Toronto when it comes to gender, gender. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and where it sits and all the construct for it. Um, okay. So we're down to 15 seconds for 41. Uh -oh. I know. <laughs> ah! um, but before we go into we have nine seconds to ask this question, what's the funniest thing you've done today? <laughs> I need to know. The funniest thing. Uh, oh my, I, the, the pressure. Uh, I know I, I, Oh my God. I, well, I mean, I had a horrible thought to myself while I was sitting outside park. <laughs> um, share, share. <laughs> uh, but the funniest oh. thing I've actually done, I, you know, my boyfriend is up North right now. I'm living by myself. I have talked to exactly you uh, for a few minutes outside parlor and now, and I'm sorry. I don't know if I, you know, I mean, I walked into parlor, ordered my coffee and cracked a couple jokes about what, what I wish for in the new year, but I edit, I don't know. I, you know, no, I don't have a, it's not like I put a whoopee cushion under anybody's <laughs> or anything like that. But uh, yeah, if I'm ever on your show again, I will try to come up with a better answer for that. No, 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 there, it is a life. It doesn't have to be a better, that is the best answer is the truth. Okay. <laughs> Wait, what are the what are the things that you wish for in twenty twenty one? Oh, at Parlor, there's um, there's a whole like in front of where the like at the bar at the coffee bar, okay. there's a giant like the owner got it made is this giant wooden um, kind of holder like it not a holder but it's like it's a kind of a, it's a whole shelf that's quite elaborate that where you can put all the where if you are having an event in Winnipeg and you've got a postcard for your event to advertise it, uh, you can put it on this, this big, like kind of like postcard holder at parlor. And right. when there's not a pandemic, it's filled with postcards and you can go into the coffee shop and find out all the great arts events, cultural events, Ooh. fundraisers, you know, musical performances, whatever festivals, you can, you know, pick up all the postcards and know what's going on in Winnipeg that weekend. Um, there are exactly zero postcards on that. You know, there's just nothing going on, right? right? So, um, so my, my big wish was that by the, the end of the year, at least, I hope that um, that huge postcard holder might be uh, filled once again. Yeah. At well, least by Nuit Blanche, because there, that um is a great night in winnipeg and way effing better than nuit blanche in toronto because i've done that too uh so yeah end of last saturday in september book it nuit blanche and it's all centered here in the exchange district and it's uh just a giant super fun outdoor party uh, with great art and great people and everything yeah First of all, I love that we ended with a wish that Winnipeg gets to be back at capacity of arts and culture and fun, especially the exchange district. So what a great way to like, I feel like I don't, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna end the way we typically end because this was such a great wish and so Winnipeg of you. <laughs> and what a great way to wrap up uh, the episode. And I really hope I'm, I'm, I hope I'm here in Winnipeg for September. I mean, the goal is to, to be here longer and I'd love to be able to reconnect in September and see what the world looks like. And let's talk about uh, 
New Blanche of Winnipeg and how much better it is than Toronto. I'm 100% on board for that. <laughs> so we're not going to end the way we typically end, but I'm going to say thank you to everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules to tune in with myself and the lifelong Winnipegger. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you bitches soon. Bye.